Outrocast. Are you dialing in like I am from Long Beach, New York today? That's right. You're in Long Beach? Yeah, somebody's got to be, right? Man, right down the block. Awesome. Where are you at? Uh, the east end, the shore part of Long Beach. Cool, yeah. I'm I'm east end, back by the bay. Nice. I mean, two-fifths of your band is local here, and there's been a lot of sightings of Taking Back Sunday around town lately. Yeah. There's the Shines thing, there was the Boardwalk stuff. Is the Boardwalk yeah. stuff part of the next music video that's coming? The Boardwalk stuff, uh, we had some technical difficulties, so it didn't turn out uh, how, how we would have liked, unfortunately. So I don't know if that's going to make the cut ever. We did get a whole lot of like B-roll stuff, so I don't know if it'll see the light of day in the future, but hopefully. Well, relate to that. Who's the member that would go, we we should film at Shines? Keep in mind, Shines is one of my favorite bars, but Taking Back Sunday does not come across as a Shines band. <laughs> well, we're old men. I think that that's the thing. Like we, We've we kind of aged like a fine wine. So that was initially Mark's idea, um, our drummer, who also lives in Long Beach, but loves that place. We all love that place. Like Their Bloody Marys are unmatched. And my wife and I would go there when our kids were really, really young. We'd get like a little date day, go have a Bloody Mary there, then cruise around the West End before we had to go back to parent duty. So a lot of, lot of fun memories. Like my, I think my great grandfather used to drink there uh, pretty heavily, and my grandmother would have to go and, and get him out of the bar, bring him back to their bungalow that they had on New York and stuff. So, uh, so yeah, a lot of family tie-ins. My dad made his first trip there. I think it was about a, a little a year and a half ago. I got him there and drank some pints of Guinness and stuff. So it's pretty rad. Wow. Oh, well, that's not the only town that's getting features in your new videos because we see you guys in Montauk. We yeah. see uh, good old Christian McKnight make a cameo in that backyard music video. So in a way, it's kind of a return to roots. Was that a conscious thing? Yeah, yeah, it was definitely something we thought about. Uh, we definitely uh, just out of uh, out of the way things worked out. Um, Mark had found us a studio out out east on Long Island. Um, name is blank in me. It'll come back to me. Oh, Voodoo Studios oh, in Port yeah. Jefferson. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so our guy Frank over there was was awesome at engineering stuff, and and it was you know a little post COVID time, so we didn't want too many people, and we knew Frank was awesome, and and really cool to work with so we just started booking airbnbs out there and to talk it and, and stuff and it, it was like a little bit out of necessity like the two of us were already here kind of already so uh so less flights to book and stuff like that but we started reconnecting with long island throughout the process of making this record writing and recording and then just, just having this and, and connecting to the area then we found this uh wonderful house in in miller place and that's where we shot all the the cover stuff. We're in the water in the Long Island Sound, and so that so was just like we're we're so connected to this. We want to embrace this. We want to like remind everybody, hey, we love Long Island. We're from here. We started doing these holiday shows in Mulcahy's a couple of years back, and they've been tremendous. Right. So so we we felt a lot of love for Long Island, and Long Island's been very good to us. Right. I uh, not to make it too much about me, but I remember seeing some of the early Taking Back Sunday gigs at BFW Halls and the Vanderbilt and Plainview. I think I saw yeah. the Hero Show, Backstreet. Nice. Who's... Now, was a lot of that recorded? Is that archival stuff that people have? I think I think there are. Yeah, I think there's one one show at the the Club de Sahara. I think the the whole show is on YouTube, and there's like you know thirty people there, oh. and that was like a really good show. Yes. Was, we're playing in front of the waterfall and stuff. And we had a blast playing that. I remember it like it was yesterday, pretty much. So yeah, then then we later played uh, played a show there with Thursday, and like the thing was sold out, and they had a real stage set up and stuff. And oh yeah, I was talking Lee Tepper's ear off that night at that at that show, and so it was fantastic to see the ascent of Taking Back Sunday, and it never really slowed down. A around when, and I'm sorry I cut you off right there. Yeah. But Around when was the point where you realized, oh, okay, this is this is a career, this is a living? Was it about two thousand four? Well, I you know, I left the band for seven years, so I wasn't around for like for those things. But yeah, it was a very complicated thing because Tell Your Friends came out, and I thought the record would come out. We would tour through the summer and then go back to our normal jobs and stuff. I didn't think the record had any real life. I didn't understand that. Um, I didn't understand that Victory Records would push that thing to the moon and back and right. and really set us up. Uh, I, I had no idea because we didn't know anyone that did 
music as a career uh, you know like sure there were these guys that we knew in the, in the movie life and things like that they'd get in the van and go on tour and have record deals and come home with some money and they didn't have to work jobs and stuff thought that that was awesome like that that'd be amazing if we could do that but ultimately i'm gonna have to have another career and i'm kind of still afraid that that day might come but uh but it, it was when when we reconnected back in 2010 and we had some had some success with our self-titled record and I knew we keep touring and, and Mark has always kind of had a thing like, okay, I think we got five more years. I think we got five more years thinking, you know, we might have to rethink this in five years, but as of right now, the five-year plan, like we're, we're still good in the band. We don't have to go back and, and figure out uh, other ideas. So I think it's like an ever evolving thing, but I think, um, I think since then we've kind of thought about, okay, we have this chemistry together. It's unmatched. It's, it's between us and uh and it's a really special thing and we're greater than the sum of our parts when we're together so i think we can do this and we can embrace this so that that's when i i've been with with my girlfriend who's been my wife now for 12 years and like it was like okay i want i gotta put all these pieces together this is this is my career now and i'm gonna take it real seriously i had such a brain fart that i just forgot about stray light ron i was at the yeah, yeah. downtown where there was kind of like a security guard position to guard you guys backstage because there was all these record companies that came out for that show. That was, a, I think it was you and Jameson Parker on that show. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They were they were a hot thing. They had a lot of a lot of labels hungry for them, and I remember Andy Nichols was managing them. Yeah. And yeah, they they were blown up. They had so much attention too, and and we did too, which was nice because we were kind of in limbo whether or not we we're going to resign with Victory or, or approach. You know, we met with a ton of labels. Yeah. Yeah. So, hey, back to back to this decade. Uh, 152 uh, is the lore goes. You started it right before the pandemic. Is anything that we hear on the final record actually from the February 2020 sessions? I don't I don't know exactly what. Um, I remember the songs we had worked on uh, there. There's a song called I'm the only one who knows you. I think from the initial demo, there might be a little guitar snippet because that song was like a much more like rollicking punk rock song that we've since made a ballad. And uh, and so there there is a brief moment where I think that that might sneak in there, I think. And uh, I think it's pretty cool. But uh, yeah, so that might be from the initial demo. I'm not sure. But yeah, it was, it was bizarre. We we flew down to, to Charlotte, North Carolina to begin work on this in March of 2020. I was in the airport. I was talking with our manager, Jillian, on the phone. She's like, I know, like, things are getting weird with this virus that we've heard about. Like, are you guys okay? Do you need anything? Like, like JFK is pretty empty. This is this is a little odd, but <laughs> I, th I think we're all right. We I think we did five days maybe down there. And flying home, it was even crazier because Charlotte Airport was packed and people were getting scared. People were starting to wear gloves. I saw a lot of people gloved up on the plane. No one was wearing face masks or anything. That was like not in our our vocabulary then. So right. I'm like, man, this is this is getting kind of weird. So we're gonna go home and, and see where we're at and hopefully we can plan another trip. But we're gonna hold off on that. And we had a couple of shows planned. I think we we're going to New Orleans maybe the end of March or something, or it was early April. And and we're like, we gotta kind of wait and see if this is gonna actually pan out and it didn't and we shut down for uh, over a year before we got back in the same room together again got it so unclear but it looks like mostly 2022 and 2023 recordings on this new record now i i think the fact that it's out on the fantasy records label growing up a big credence fan now yes. concord which is the parent company of fantasy they own so many companies that we don't realize like craft recordings etc did you specifically say, hey, we want to be on Fantasy Records, or is that just, hey, you're on Fantasy? They they approached us. So so that was cool. Um, we had they owned basically all our back catalog from the Victory Years and the Warner Brothers years. And we had worked with them with putting out our 20 year release. And we we were in their offices in 2019 and I really, really loved the vibe. We had a lot of old friends that worked there from the different labels we'd been on in the past. And I just kind of said to myself, it'd be really cool if we put out a record with with these people. And I don't know how or why or you know what's going to work out or if they're interested, but it'd be really cool to get back here. So uh, time passes and stuff. We made the record. We had a lot of demos we were showing to to different friends and stuff and different labels. And Fantasy came with a very very strong offer. And we had a really nice back and forth with them. And it was clear that they were very passionate and very excited and had like the coolest marketing ideas and stuff, uh, you know, in the very initial stages from the, from the jump. And we said, okay, I think, I think this is our spot. 
And then um, what was really, really cool when we were on this sad summer tour before we played the show in Irvine, we'd, we'd flown from Texas in and we knew we were going to have a meeting with the label. We were going to start planning and, and, and kick around ideas for how we wanted this record to come out. And they presented us with platinum plaques for our Tell Your Friends record, which we were totally not expecting. They surprised yeah. us. They coordinated with Jillian, our manager. And we're back in that same building that we'd have been in in 2019. I'm like, this is like such a cool full circle thing. The past is reuniting, you know, is, is combining with the present. And, you know, we're going to see what the future holds. I'm so happy we're doing it with them. The, the name Jillian came up again. And she's been managing you guys the whole time. So when I when I go down that list and I go, Jillian's been there. Your back catalog is all kind of together in the same place. And there's label friends there. The four of you have been working together on and off for 20-ish years. Everything is super long-term with Taking Back Sunday. I'd have to imagine there's a lot of relief to that. There's not a lot of skeletons in the closet. Yeah, everybody knows. Everybody knows each other's dirty past. But uh, but no, we we have such a, a great relationship. We have such a strong bond with each other. Um, we're, we're, we try to get better continually with communication, and we work on that. And, and try to give each other what we need and give each other space when we need it or get on each other if someone's slacking. And, and it's all right because we know it's just for the greater good. But there's a certain chemistry there with her, too. She knows she knows how we operate. She yeah. knows sometimes we need time to be with our families. But then there's also a time where we got to work and we got to get on the road. We got to do things. And, and so she's really good at handling all that and all the behind the scenes stuff, like handling the finances, the marketing, the this and the that, like all, all the silly stuff day to day. Like she knows sometimes there's stuff she doesn't want to bother us with. Like this is, well, we got a crummy offer. I'm not even going to tell you about it, you know, like, and she's, she's really great at, at picking and choosing her battles with that and trying to appease the four of us on a daily basis, which is not easy when we all have much different needs. But yeah, yeah, there's such a comfort there. We're all committed people, you know, we're all married guys with families and stuff. So like, that's just part of the commitment. And, and it's really nice to be able to rely on each other. Well, down to the last three questions before I let you go. The, the yeah. first one is, I find that multi-platinum bands, the members usually have low key side projects that are very much the opposite of what the people do in their day job. I know about some of Mark's stuff. Are there any secret or low key Sean projects? No, no. Everything, you know, everything musically I put into uh, is hundred percent taking back Sunday. Like I love having my, my, one of my favorite hobbies is my job playing bass and, and making music with these guys. So like there, there's such an awesome chemistry that we have together that I kind of don't even want to, spend time messing around outside of taking back Sunday with music. I have a whole lot of other hobbies and passions and stuff like things I'm, I'm super into outside of the band. And that I think keeps my, my mind fresh for making music. Well, the follow up to that, are you allowed to say what some of those hobbies are? For example, are you one of the golf punk rock people? I just started playing golf. I'm really, really bad at it. I, I've been trying to learn to take, I was taking lessons last year and stuff when we had some time at home. We had like January to June where I was just kind of messing around with that. It's ugly, man. It's ugly. I'd like to get better. Um, I kickbox with one of my buddies in the backyard. Um, you know, I just have fun hitting stuff. You know, I never, ever want to be in any sort of confrontation. I have no uh illusions that i want to compete in anything i've been doing brazilian jiu-jitsu for since 2007 that was like such a big thing like my hobbies were the band and the bar stool so like getting to work out that way and and you, it's like a real life video game and uh and i just have so much fun with it train at uh matt sarah's school sarah bjj out in huntington i haven't been there in a while due to band obligations and stuff and family stuff, but I just love going out there and training with those guys. And there's such a camaraderie too. I just, I, I love it. So those are, those are like the big things. Got it. The last question for you, and I don't know if this gets a five second answer or a five minute answer. You be a okay. judge here, a bass player. What was the band or bands that made you start playing bass? I'm guessing from being a similar age to me, it was Green Day or Weezer, but or does it go back to Van Halen and Motley Crue? Close. So, so like, what what made me want to be in a band, and I didn't know in what capacity. I was too young. It was the Beatles and Guns N' Roses. My parents introduced me to the Beatles. My best friend Neil Amarudin introduced me to Guns N' Roses. He had older brothers. I was like six or seven years old. So like the Beatles are like a lifelong thing. And I remember hearing Twist and Shout and be like, this is rock and roll. This is amazing. Because of Ferris Bueller's Day Off? 
it was probably something like that. I think it was yeah. probably pre, you know, my dad had like a greatest hits cassette. I can't even remember. Like, I just remember they're all on the cover, like wearing hats and stuff. And I, he had some greatest hits thing that he would play in his Monte Carlo. And I remember that cassette tape. I remember the smell of it and, and just cruising around Baldwin where I grew up really? uh, and, and that really connecting. But then Guns N' Roses was like, I want to do what they're doing. I need to do this. But I, you know, I tried playing guitar and stuff in first grade. It didn't really work out. My hands were too small. And then, then really the catalyst for bass playing, 100% was Nirvana. My my buddy Nick, he's still one of my best friends to this day. He was playing guitar. He got really proficient, and he was going to a really cool music teacher that would give him tablature to any song he brought in. Mm. And uh, I got a bass for my 12th birthday. And I'm like, I got, I got to learn how to do this. So I started going to his guitar teacher, learning bass. And I could play Nirvana songs right off the bat, right out of the gate. They were simple enough. They weren't too complicated. And and so that really made me think, okay, cool. I can play bass in a band. You know, these songs are pretty simple. And then we kind of go from there and, and go off in all different directions and stuff. But yeah, those were the big three. Beatles, Guns N' Roses, Nirvana, 100%. I love Motley Crue too. Like they were super inspiring. Nikki Six lighting his legs up on fire and stuff. I was like, these guys are terrifying and they're kind of hot too. Like, I don't know, like the shadow of the devil makeup and stuff. I was like, are they women? Are they men? I don't know. But this is this yeah. is fascinating to me. Are they pro wrestlers? I think like I didn't know what what anything was, but yeah, they, they were huge huge inspiration. Same thing uh, happened with the people with the first Poison album to the Look What the Cat Dragged In. But yeah, 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 yeah. I, I I listen to that record like crazy. Yeah, and they look they look great on the cover. Well, I appreciate you not going. Oh, it was all Fugazi. That's uh, I've only been a punk rock guy. Uh, suffered by bad religion. It, no. Uh, yeah, it's, it's good to know that your influence is shown in, in a great way. And congratulations on 152. Looking forward to all the future gigs, maybe seeing some Long Beach footage in the next music video. But in the meantime, oh, yeah. Sean, thanks for being you all these decades later. Darren, great to meet you, too. And I'm glad we're practically neighbors. That's awesome. Great. Always great talking to a Long Beach guy. Outro cast.